We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 15. Uh, just to kind of give you a little background, verses 1 through 14 is basically the loving walk. It's shooting out a bunch of things that you do, doesn't belong in our walk. Uh, it's saying walk in love. It's saying basically we need to walk in a way that people see us and know that Jesus loves them. That people come alongside us, people interact with us, and they realize that Jesus loves them and He died on a cross for their sins. That's verses 1-14. through 14. We're going to start on 15. And um, that's, uh, that's kind of our context, but uh, this life that we, this kind of is set up here, it's one that really just says to everyone that we meet, Jesus loves you and so do I. So we are in verse 15 and it says this, and I, and I warned my Sunday school class, we actually discussed this verse last week in Sunday school, just kind of came up and just kind of, God just left it on my heart uh, whenever I was asked to, uh, to uh, bring the message this morning and he was still working on it in, in different ways, but uh, he was still working on it. So verse 15 of chapter 5 of Ephesians says this, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. I'm going to read the whole section just to, just to kind of get in our, our minds and our hearts. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Giving thanks always. And for everything to God the Father and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, I am so incredibly humbled by you this morning, Father. I am so incredibly overwhelmed by your grace. I am so incredibly taken back, Father, that you have plucked me out, Father, that you have blessed me so richly, Father, that I might know you, Father. That I might be saved, I might receive your beautiful gift of salvation, Lord. This morning I pray that I might impart your words, Father, as you see fit, not as I see fit. Father, that you would use me, Father, that uh, you would excuse me from the picture, but just you, Father, be seen. Hide me behind the cross this morning. We love you, Father. May you be glorified this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Walk. Walking. Something I, I used to take for granted. Um, I, uh, I know that some of you have had issues before. I, I actually talked to some of my friends this week that have had some issues, whether it was with their ankles, their knees, or how many of you have ever had trouble walking for one reason or another? Everyone should raise your hand because when you were a baby, you had trouble walking, okay? Everyone's included in that. Okay, yeah, good. Now they're up. All right. But uh, that, that's what that word, that word walk, what does that mean? That, that word walk. What are you talking about, Ronnie? It's, is it like my stride, my strut, my, no, skipping. Don't you dare skip. No, it's not, it's not talking about your literal walking with your feet. It is walk, talking about as you go forward. It is how you live. It is your life as you move forward from day to day. As you move forward and affect the world. And it says, as I love, look carefully. My dad used to say, pay attention. Anybody's dad ever say, pay attention? A lot. That was me. Ronnie, pay attention. Ronnie, pay attention. Pay attention. I find myself saying that from time to time. I have wonderful children. Beautiful, wonderful children. They're right back there. Well, all but one of them, one of them's downstairs. Pay attention, pay attention, listen, listen to me, okay? Repeat after me, you know, pay attention. I love that phrase, pay attention, invest your effort, invest your, your attention, your focus on this. Pay attention. And, and the story came to my mind whenever I was writing this, I actually had to call some family members to make sure I was recounting it correctly. You ever have just kind of a story in your mind, you're like, did this really happen? Or is this something I just, you know, I just laugh at continually? Well, whenever I was about 11 years old, 
my family, uh, minus my mom, she was working on something else, but my three older sisters and myself, we were all outside, out in, you know, kind of beside the pasture, there's a specific pen we had for the horses, and we were building a round pen. Everybody, anybody ever built a round pen? Okay, okay, cool. All right, we were building a round pen. Well, for the specific length of board of our rails on our fence, my dad said, went to my, my youngest older sister, Corey, and said, Corey, I want you to measure and mark all of these boards seven feet. And he took a tape measure and he put it out, marked one seven, seven feet, took the Swanton Speed Square, put it on there, just like that. I want you to cut it. I want you to, to mark it just like that. And my sister, Corey, said, okay, yes, sir. And she went over to the pile of boards. I mean, a big pile of boards. She got that tape measure and she went, well, here's my deal. I was the one that took the boards after they were marked, put them on the sawhorses, and my dad cut them. All right? Everybody, everybody down with this system? All right? So I did that. And we, we were just cranking them out. I mean, Henry Ford couldn't have done it better. We were just, is this marking? Marking, carrying to the sawhorse, cutting, taking them to the pile, the finished pile. We were marking, cutting, taking them to the finished pile. And we did this for a while. And then my dad stopped for a second. And he looked at the pile of boards. And he said, you know what? These, these actually look a little shorter. What? Let, Corey, let me borrow that tape measure. And I'm not talking about three or four boards. I'm talking about like 40 boards, okay? Because we're trying to we to get all the way around. This is a six rail round pin. And my dad takes a tape measure over there, runs it out. And he said, Corey, how, how long did I, I tell you to mark these boards? And Corey said, six feet. <laughs> my dad just chuckled. You know, in those situations where you can't, you're not going to cry. So you might as well laugh. So my dad, looking at this, these boards, this pile of money on the ground that uh, it just got lit on fire for the most part. He, he said, no, no, Corey, I, I said, cut them or mark them seven feet. All, all these boards are supposed to be seven feet. Our posts are already in the ground. These boards need to be seven feet. And Corey said, oh, I thought you said six feet. So it became this thing in my family time that, uh, you know, somebody didn't listen or, you know, started just not paying attention to anything. We would say, seven feet, Corey, seven feet. Because we don't always pay attention, right? We don't always look carefully. But from that day forward, you better believe my sister double-checked how far or how long she was supposed to measure anything she was ever given. It pays to pay attention. Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Pay attention. Don't take your eyes off of it. We need to watch how we walk. Watch out for the stuff in our path. I thought about three things that get in our way spiritually. As I was studying, there were three things that just kind of, uh, and I, I wouldn't stack this up to any type of theological debate. I just thought that for me in my life, these are three categories that I see prevalent in my walk with Christ. Something I, I see prevalent in my life, in my, on my path. There are three things that get in the way spiritually. First thing, obstacles. Can I get an amen? Amen. Illnesses. Hurdles. Valleys. Betrayal. Losing your job. Difficulty. Maybe you think that your world is over because your sports team can't seem to win the last game of the season. <laughs> Obstacles. You know what I'm talking about. 
The, same, the things that stop you in your tracks. A death in the family. Unexpected. Crazy things that come at you from left field that you had no idea were even possible. Obstacles. That's number one. Number two, traps. Just as effective, but seemingly worse, right? When anybody, this is just me. I, my imagination is constantly going. Doesn't turn off. I, I've tried. It just doesn't happen. Whenever I think of traps, I think of Indiana Jones. You know, the first one, the best one in my opinion. You know, it's. Uh, I believe it's the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. Okay, let's make sure. All right. And he, he, he takes the the bag of dirt or sand, and, he, and then he, he's getting like the golden cat or whatever it was. I don't know something. And he goes. Nothing happens for about three seconds. I'm like, oh, yeah, I did it. And then all of a sudden, starts going down. All of a sudden, everything starts falling apart. He takes off running, and there's spears, and there's this humongous boulder that you know is made out of paper mache. But it's a humongous boulder. It's rolling down. It's going to kill him and smash him flat. And he, he, he gives his whip to his, his, his guy that's helping him, and he, he just takes it and takes it. He said, throw me the thing or whatever it is. He throws it to him, and then he takes off with his whip. Right? So he's left there about to die. Traps. Traps or temptations. Areas of struggle. Traps are cycles of doubt and who God made you and, and how He has called you out. Traps are detours that promise to get you earthly rich quick by way of departing from where God wants you to be because the worldly life looks so glamorous. It gets way more likes and thumbs up from the masses. Traps are loving money and position over our Savior. Traps are being wooed by anything that says being a follower of Christ is too hard and takes too much time. Devotion and worship? Wait, no, 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 no. You're saying that I should give a tenth of my income to the Lord. Tithing. You're saying I should do that. You're saying I should devote half of my weekend to worshiping with other believers, not forsaking the assembly. Traps like that. Traps like being more vigilant about my family's bank account than I am about the hearts and souls of my children. Financial security over eternal security. Traps. That's, that's the second thing I see get in the way of our path spiritually. The third thing is an ambush. Even still, probably worse. Because what, you know what an ambush denotes? What does an ambush take? Surprise. Bad surprise, yeah. It's not like a cake. It's a bad surprise. But what does it take? It uses other what? Other people. He uses other people. I, I think we could probably all just can say, well, obviously he's going to use Job. Yeah, I'm going to use Job. Job's so called friends, one after the other. Job's wife, curse God and die. Now that's some good spousal advice, right? Oh, honey, I know it's so hard and you know, you've been going through so much. Curse God and die. David's wife, McCall. McCall! That's what I think of every time I read her name. <laughs> McCall! Anyway, but that is probably one of the clearest definitions where someone is worshiping God, giving glory to God. I, I, I think of David every time I see Zoe. Dancing in worship, she loves, she can't help it. It's like part of her DNA. She can't help it, see? Um, but that, that's what I think about because David, whenever he's coming back in and he's celebrating, he's giving God the glory. Was he here? From a call. Oh, look at you. Huh. Looking like one of the vulgar fellows. While your servants, servants, Female servants are looking at you in your indignity. Look at you. How, how, how awesome is that? 
very, very skeptic, very snide, very sarcastic. And what does he turn around and say? No, actually, I'm giving glory to God. I'm worshiping. I will dance even more undignified than this. That's what I'll do. <laughs> I, love, I love God's Word because what, what, what does it say about McCall right after that? Pretty much that was the end of her story. <laughs> it really does. It kind of sums it up. It's like, yeah, and she had no children until the day she died. She's dead. Ambushes. Not picking on wives, I promise you. But uh, see, here's one. Here's a husband. Abigail's husband. Nabal. This guy, what do you say? Oh, yeah. David? No, 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 no. Why should I give anything to him? Abigail's, no, no, you don't understand. You, you don't understand. I, and she brought, her, brought him fig cakes and she listened to the Lord. Ambush. And ambush comes in many forms. And I, and I use biblical examples, but I think we all have those family examples. Can, can, I, can I share something with you kind of behind the scenes? I was a student pastor for about 16 years. And uh, do you know that the most, and my wife knows this, I've said this several times, did you know that the most intense parent meetings that I ever had, they weren't about uh, just their heart was broken about their kids. They, they, I, I, it's just they're, they're, you know, I don't understand. What's, I had some of those, but you know what the majority was? Like the, the big part of the pie chart? It was parents coming into my office or calling me or emailing me because they didn't like the way I challenged their student to pursue Christ over everything else in the world. I'm talking about yelling at me before I would come up to preach. Not here. The yelling was previous. But still it happened here. No, no, Ronnie, you don't understand. You can't tell kids that they need to pursue Christ. And, but we have priorities. They're going to get this scholarship. They're going to do this. I'm not saying that they're not going to do that. I'm not, going to say, I'm not saying that they're not going to you know, pursue academically the best that they totally should. Absolutely do that. I'm not saying that. But Ronnie, you can't just bring that up like they should serve the Lord, that they should you know, pursue God's call on their lives. I, I'll never forget... Um, Mary Michael is not the confrontation one in our in our relationship. She uh, she's probably been on in two about two of those meetings, roughly, maybe three. No, three actually. I think yeah, she's been in three. Okay, she's been in about three of those that she has shouldered that with me. And I'll tell you what the, the thing that just kind of breaks my heart because this is ambush. This is what I'm talking about. Is that my wife would sit in my office or in our living room or in their living room or whatever it was, and she would just have tears coming out of her eyes. Because she could see, she could see the battle that was there. And beloved, let me tell you, the battle is there. If you have family members that say, why do you go to church? Why, why do you give up part of your income to those people at that church. I, I, I don't give my income to people. I give my income to God because it's His already. I go and I serve because that's what I'm called to do. Regardless of the people that yell at me from the sidelines, from the shoulder of the road, that try to pull me away. You know what? Ambush is real. And sometimes you, you don't see it for what it is in the moment. Ambush is real. Now, will these things happen? Absolutely. The traps, the temptations, the struggles, the, the pulling off of the road that, that you were on. You're like, oh man, this is so great. I, I'm, I'm digging deep into God's Word and, and, and I, I know what He wants me to do. 
And I know it's above this other thing that's really, everyone else says, is the main priority. But I know that that is just, if nothing else, a, a platform for me to do what God has called me to do. That's a stepping stone to get to the place where I am, where God wants me to be. I consider myself to be the most blessed man that have, has ever lived. I truly do. I truly, truly do. Large in part because God gave me the wife that he's given me, the family that he's given me. And I still experience these things every day, every stinking day. So how do we know? How do we know which way to go? How do we know which job to take? What, who to date? Who to marry? What? That's huge. Dear Lord, uh, it's kind of a big deal. Randy brought that up earlier. You're right. That's, that's, that's huge. It's like going on a date and then having, it's like, hey, yeah, so I guess, you know me? Forever. It doesn't happen like that. I remember, this is kind of a commercial, I apologize, but I remember whenever I was five years old, sitting on my tailgate, or my dad's tailgate of his truck. I didn't have a truck at that time. I was five. Come on, come down. And I remember him telling me, he said, Ronnie, I want you to know I am praying for your future wife. As a five-year-old, I was like, yeah? I don't know. The girls are weird. <laughs> the, the, amen. <laughs> the majority of my experience with girls were my three older sisters, and they were terrible. So I didn't think that was a nice thing that he was praying for my future wife at the moment. So how do we know where to live, where to go to church, how to raise our kids? How to raise our stinking kids? That's not an easy question. It's not an easy path. How, how to deal with obstacles, traps, and ambushes? Well, look, verse 16 says this, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is. So Ronnie, you're going to tell me what the Lord's will for my life? Some of my favorite quotes. I told a friend of mine, and, um, I was going to share this. A.W. Pink says, we cannot know His will if we are ignorant of His word. If I were to drop this mic, it probably wouldn't work anymore, so I'm not going to do that. I need a fake mic just to do that when I need to. We cannot know His will if we are ignorant of His word. John 15, 4 says, Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I love that word abide. It's just like what we're talking about, the walk. It's live. It's life. Live in me. Dwell in me. Have you ever had that friend that gives you advice whether you ask for it or not? You know what I'm talking about. You'd be like, yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. No, don't look. Don't look at them. Don't. Okay, yes, we're all, most of us that are sitting next to our spouses, you're looking directly at your spouse. I know that because Mary Mock, actually this happened yesterday. No, day before yesterday. Uh, she knows when I'm about to, to get off track, like I'm about to, to get like off base. So I was talking about cleaning out the garage and she said, she said, why do you need to do that specifically? I don't know what you're talking about. She immediately brought it up. Like I knew, she knew that I was going off track. I was to do something crazy. I was to bring something else into the garage, my truck, so I could work on it. Yeah, she's like, nah, -uh, my, my van's going in the garage when you get it cleaned out. But I, I got ahead of it. I was like, no, nah, just so I can get your van in. That's what I was doing. You feel like you're in a phone booth with them all the time. <laughs> like, like they catch you like, oh, don't, no, nah, don't do that. Because they know what you're about to do or when you're about to say something stupid or do something you really shouldn't or go down a path you shouldn't. That closeness, that's what that means. That closeness. Because what happens? After a while, 
whether my wife's there or not, whenever I start to think about something like that, I'm like, actually, I know exactly what Mary Michael would say. Oh, Ronnie, don't bring that home. Don't, don't, just because there's a tree on the side of the road that you could carve up and make a canoe out of, don't bring it home. That's, a, that's not a real thing, but now that I think of that, <laughs> the verse that follows says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Oh, man. Have any of you ever um, seen, I want to say it's like a, a professor or somebody, I don't know, it might have been a pastor, but they have a jar, Right? They have a jar and they put golf balls in it. They say, is that jar full? It was like, yeah, it's full. You can't have any more golf balls in there. Then he takes some marbles and he pours the mar- marbles in. He shifts them around and there's, he's like, well, how about now? Is that full? And they're like, oh, no, yeah, actually, no, it's full because it's got marbles. Then he takes BBs. He puts BBs in. Just puts all these BBs, just, just like Plinko on Price is Right. Just goes all down. It's like, it's full. Like, yeah, now it's full. Then he takes sand. Pours sand in. So all the sand goes filling in. It's like full. And they're like, yes, it's full. Done. Class dismissed. He's like, uh uh uh. He takes a picture, a pitcher of water, like an un, just an inordinate amount of water, and he just starts to pour this water in until it's completely filled. That's us. We are that pitcher. We have all these things in our lives. And what the scripture is saying, a lot of people, you know, we like to, to focus on the don't get drunk with wine, which we're not supposed to be. It says, do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, that drunkenness. Proverbs, I want to say 23. There's several instances where it, it denotes specific drunkenness. That's not who we're supposed to be. But what it does right here in this verse, the reason that God gave us this word is because he knows us. And it puts in this verse, it says, it's, it puts drunkenness with wine on one side, and then on the other side it says filled with the Spirit. So it's the two differences. And it elevates it. It elevates being filled with the Spirit. As I was studying this week, I was getting into this, and it just really just kind of just just worked on my heart, just wrenched on my heart. Being filled with the Spirit. Because as believers, we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, right? Amen? All right? Now, being indwelt with the Spirit does not, just because we're indwelt, does not mean that that Spirit is taking control all, all the way, Right? But that's what the Scripture is talking about, being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's pushing out the other marbles. It's pushing out the golf balls that don't belong there. Being filled. The Spirit's the water. The Spirit's supposed to encompass it all to truly fill us. Pushing out those other things, pushing out those those things that, that just don't belong. We know those things that don't belong in our lives. But carefully how you walk. You don't get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no command in Scripture that says uh, to be indwelt with the Spirit. But be filled. We can't increase the Spirit. All we can do is push the other things out and increase the control of the Spirit within us. We can give more over. You know those little things you hold on to? You kind of just, like, I'm going I'm to hold on to this. Have you ever watched a, an episode of Hoarders? That'll make you feel better about your house being dirty. It's, it's kind of, while we're feeding Lila, that's kind of become a thing. We'll, we'll turn that on. And there's a thing on Hoarders that they always watch out for. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. But then like, they'll watch for them because sometimes they'll like, grab something and it'll disappear for a little bit. And they'll hide it. They'll take these things that they're supposed to be getting out of their lives. And they'll go and they'll, they'll have a little pocket, like a little hiding place. Boom. Boom. And then there'll be this big reveal. Well, we noticed 
that you were disappearing, that there were some things that uh, you were hiding away. Well, I just didn't want anybody to touch that. What are those things? What are those things that you don't want anybody else to see, that you don't want the Spirit to really take control over? I, uh, I mentioned the quote by A.W. Pink and not knowing his will, if we're ignorant of his word. I think, well, Ronnie, I don't have time. I don't have time to get into the word. Honestly, I'm so busy. I, I, I'm Making time to be here on Sundays is, is a stretch, honestly. I, I'm, I'm kind of just doing good to do that. I don't know what you're talking about being filled with all these other things. Anybody ever say, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have time. Raise your hand if you've ever said, I don't have time to do the things I need to do. Raise your hand if you've ever said that. You say it all the time, right? Well, let, let, me, let me give you a test, okay? This is sectional. This is the different sections, okay? If you're over 30, get off of Facebook. Get off of Netflix, Hulu, the TV, whatever your thing is. Go a season without watching your team or any team. If you're under 30, get off of Instagram. Stop watching TikToks. Delete Snapchat. <laughs> Not my snappy. I'm sorry. If you're over 60... Amen or oh me? You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. I, I don't have to give the direct illustration that gossiping or whatever. I don't have to give you the direct. You know what I'm talking about because that's how the Holy Spirit works. That's how He works within us. He puts right there on the front burner and says, you need to get this out. Because that's an area that I'm supposed to be in that you're, you're holding back. That you're hoarding back. I don't even have time to go through all this, but addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. Why is that in there? Why does He tell us that? Anybody? Anybody know why, why that's in there? Because we are naturally grumpy. We are. When we're tired, when we are hungry, when we're whatever, we're grumpy. And He knows that. And He knows that we're going to go a good bit of our lives being tired, being hungry. And He says, no, no. This is how you're supposed to act and greet each other and live your lives. It's filled with my joy and sharing my joy. So where are you this morning? In this right here. Ronnie, where do I start? <laughs> what do I do if all, all, uh, I've spent all my time on these obstacles? I, that's it, that seems like that's all I do. I spend time on these obstacles, these ambushes, these traps. What if all I see in my way are these traps? They're waiting for me. What do I do if the only relationships I have are those that deter me from following the Lord, serving in the ministry, and fulfilling the purpose that God has for me? What do I do? Perhaps you've been cranking out boards. <laughs> Just cranking out boards. Like, man, look, I'm doing great, man. Look at this. I got this much money in the bank. I like got my house like paid off and I'm under 40. Well, I don't know. Who, who does that? That's awesome. But I, nah. -uh. Just cranking out boards. Cranking out boards using your own measurements and forgetting entirely what the Father has given you as the way. Forgetting entirely the instructions, the word, the very specific nature of who he is and what he wants for you. You end up with a pile that doesn't measure up. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about what we produce as, I'm good enough. No, you're not. You, I, we are not good enough. It's in Christ alone. So what do I do? So what do we do? Surrender. 
Surrender. Surrender. They'll never, never expect it. Surrender. Surrender entirely. Give it up. Give up. Give up trying to do that on your own for yourself. Give it up. Surrender. I love 2 Timothy verse 7 says, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Surrender this morning. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. Not, you'll get a chance to exalt yourself. He will exalt you. Our musicians are going to come up this morning. And I'm going to invite our elders to come up. And I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. I want to invite you to stand because I want to ask you as a brother that sits next to you in these pews right here, is there something that you, as well as I, we need to surrender this morning? 